Alright guys, well, don't know about this lighting, it's already getting dark earlier here. I noticed as the summer disappears, the summer of 2022, and it is Monday night, uh, where are we, July 25th, 2022, or somewhere like that. So anyway, uh, Yesterday for my Sunday sermon, I was going to do this rant, but then I ended up getting sidetracked by Chris Hedges, so uh, I'm just going to backtrack a little bit and give you kind of a, I don't know, a P.S. Doomsday sermon. Over here at Counterpunch, I, uh, now unfortunately, I guess I am paywalled out of the paid subscription to CP exclusive and it's too bad because their you know their number one story but it's only available if you know if you do the paywall is I have no idea who uh, Pete Dolak is never heard the name Pete Dolak but uh, his article, the number one story in uh, Counterpunch this week, must collapse, be inevitable. Imagining a, quote, half-Earth sustainable economy. There you go. So let's let's take this without reading the story. I, well, I think we all know. I, I, I mean, this is a channel called <coughs> Collapse Chronicles. So I think we all know the answer to the question, must collapse be inevitable? Uh, <laughs> I think think we all uh, know that one, but this whole thing, imagining a, quote, half-Earth sustainable economy. Uh, trying to diagram that sentence, uh, trying to um, imagine a half-Earth sustainable economy. Yeah, there you go. That would be that would be quite the uh, the exercise in imagination, but I'm sure Pete Dolak uh, does a uh, does quite an admirable job in some f flight of fancy uh, <laughs> trying to tell us that collapse is not inevitable if. You can only imagine a half-Earth sustainable economy. Well, I guess a half a planet, you know, half a planet, I guess, is better than no planet at all. Uh, you know, I, I, I guess I can stretch my imagination. But anyway, we're going to go to the second story, and this is the one uh, that's still actually free. Uh, from this dude, Jeffrey St. Clair. Jeffrey St. Clair, um, no, that was Michael T. Clair that I interviewed. Uh, Jeffrey's a good guy. I've read from him, and this is a short, sweet one. This is his uh, spin on all of the heat waves and all of that, and he calls his essay this week, the sky is frying, you know, a takeoff on the old song, The Sky is Crying. Anyway, take it away, Jeffrey St. Clair, and give us your spin on what's going on outside your window. Sounding kind of like Chris Hedges' spin on what was going on outside his window. <clears throat> As I sit down to write this on Thursday afternoon, so what was that, around July 21st? As I sit down to write this on Thursday afternoon, more than 100 million Americans were sweltering under extreme heat warnings, and that did not include the Pacific Northwest, 
where the vents of the blast furnace are slated to open on Monday, sparking temperatures in the 100s for most of next week, now meaning this week. It's a modest 87 at the moment here in Oregon City. Meanwhile, this week, the tarmac on the runway at London's Heathrow Airport melted after the temperatures soared to 104 Fahrenheit. It had never been 100 degrees Fahrenheit there before at any time. Fires burned across England, France, Portugal, and Spain. The surface soil temperature in Spain spiked to 138 Fahrenheit. People died on the streets, in their cars, on their bikes, in prisons and nursing homes. Europe's response to this crisis is to restart shuttered coal plants. Yes. It is raining where it has never rained before. Ice frozen 10,000 years ago is melting into milky streams. Rivers that have run for 1,500 years are now seasonal creeks. 1,000-year floods are happening every 30 years. Forests are burning beyond their capacity to regenerate, while deserts are expanding in all directions. Alpine glaciers in the Alps and the Karakaram, wherever that is, are collapsing. The cost of all of this is enormous, hundreds of billions of dollars a year in the U.S. alone. But one community's catastrophe is another's financial opportunity. Many of the same corporations driving the climate crisis are making out on the other end restoring the damage, often underwritten by government subsidies on both ends. Here there are, here meaning here back here in the U.S., there are new fires, big mean ones in Texas, Idaho, Montana, Utah, Wyoming, Colorado, Arizona, Nevada, and California, and this was the day before the Oak Fire started. Yosemite is burning. Fires are closing in on the Mariposa Grove of giant sequoias and across the Owens Valley to the east in the Inyo Range. Some of the world's oldest trees, 4,500-year-old bristlecone pines, are threatened by the mega drought, bark beetles, and displacement by the limber pine. The Great Salt Lake will soon be a Great Salt Flat, a vast basin of toxic salt that will be lifted by western winds and blown into Provo and Logan and Salt Lake City. Farther south, Lake Powell is now Glen Canyon again. Its impounded waters lower than at any time since the floodgates of that monstrous dam closed in 1963. I wish my old pals Dave Brower, Ed Abbey, and Katie Lee had lived to see this day. They would not be surprised that humanity was responsible through ignorance, complacency, and greed. Hell, Basically the same human characteristics that flooded the canyon in the first place, having been warned that this would be the inevitable result. The Colorado River is all used up, and there won't be more where that came from. The western states want water, West Virginia wants coal. It's not a fair fight. West Virginia will win every time. Even the power brokers of the West understand this dynamic. Fossil fuel comes first. So the irrigators and the real estate tycoons and the ranchers and the city managers and the casino operators and the golf course resort owners are now contemplating how to divert water from the Mississippi 
to the desert southwest. It'll have to happen soon. Time is running short. So, a certain desperation is setting in, even among the people who are profiting off our perpetual state of crisis. But it has not sharpened our politics, and it won't. This was the week Joe Munchkin performed a late-term abortion on the fetal remains of Biden's already grossly inadequate climate plan, the same week that Biden jetted off to Saudi Arabia to fist bump the Saudi dictator and frantically begged him to jack up production of Saudi crude oil but the crown prince stiffed the American president in public, a decision which may have been the only favor the Saudis have ever done for the environment. Biden, that humiliated weakling, returned to the States vowing shrilly to declare a climate emergency. This is more mystification from the machine, and only the most credulous among us could take it as anything more than a grain of toxic salt. In his first year in office, as Chris Hedges uh, mentioned in his rant, Biden had already approved more new oil drilling permits than Trump, and that was before he provoked, armed, and financed another oil war in Ukraine. None of this is surprising. It is who Biden is. It is who every American president has been or likely will be. Once our nation ran on slave labor, but since the end of the Civil War, the country is run on fossil fuels. Every institution of the government has been constructed to exploit and safeguard that power source. It's not merely that the government won't confront the climate crisis, but that it is incapable of confronting the climate crisis. To confront it would require the government to go to war against itself. For all practical purposes, the government of the U.S. is the fossil fuel industry. The sky is frying, and as the wind shifts, little bits of it began falling down as ash here in the foothills of the Cascades, hundreds of miles away from the fires in the Salmon River country and the Bitterroot Range. We have entered the inferno with no sure-footed Virgil around to guide our way back out. There you go. Uh, thank you, uh, Jeffrey St. Clair. Uh, you can find Jeffrey pretty much every week in Counterpunch. At least, uh, at least Jeffrey is not an LD lefty. Uh, he's still got a little bit of the juice left. Anywho's, with that, uh, I'm going to wrap this up, and uh, I got to get back over to Netflix to to continue with the new DB Cooper documentary. Shows you where my brain is. Bye, guys.